joining us this afternoon. Um, we are here today to talk um, about CAR-T therapy, um, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor therapy. <laughs> I forgot for myself then, uh, but I'm sure the doctors will be much better placed to explain uh, more about, about the therapy than I. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm the patient advocacy manager here at Leukemia Care, and um, I'll be chairing today's session. Um, if you'd like to participate by um, asking questions of our panelists, which we'd very much encourage, there are several ways you can do so. Um, you can, if you're um, watching on Zoom, you can um, use the chat function, which is the little speech bubble at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, we may be able to take a couple of those depending on time. Um, you can either use the raise hand function and um, then I will give you permission to speak. So you'll have to, to wait a few moments um, and you'll have to make sure also that you have a microphone on the device that you're using in order to ask a question. If you're watching on Facebook, you can ask questions just by popping in the comment section and someone will pass them over to us um, here on the panel and we'll try and address those. Um, so without further ado, let's introduce the panellists who very kindly joined us today. Sophie, maybe we could start with you. Hello, yes, I'm Sophie Walden and I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia in 2018 um, when I'd just turned 20. And I had a lot of chemotherapy and it wasn't really touching me, so they decided to go down the route of a stem cell transplant in the November of 2018. And unfortunately, after 100 days, they found out that I had relapsed and there weren't many options left for me. So that was when my consultant approached me with the possibility of CAR-T therapy. And we started that process in April of 2019. And I got my cells back in June of 2019. And I've now been in remission for two years. Perfect, thank you. It's lovely to have you here. And, um... Looking forward to hearing a bit more about your experience of having CAR-T a little bit later. Um, Claire, would you mind introducing yourself for me? Hi, so thanks for inviting me, Charlotte. Um, I'm Claire Ruddy. I work at um, University College London um, and I look after adults with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia and lymphomas. And um, we've been responsible for delivering a lot of CAR-T cell therapy in those areas. Perfect, thank you. And Sarah? Thanks, thanks for inviting me. So my name's Sarah Goreshian and I'm a haematologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and we've been delivering CAR T-cell studies through Great Ormond Street and also the UCL campus um, along with Claire's team for quite a long time. Um, so we've got lots of relevant experience of delivering both licensed products for ALL as well as studies. Perfect, thank you. And hopefully we've got Lee. I can't see him at the moment. Hi there. There we go, perfect. Hi, Lee. Can you just Good introduce afternoon. yourself for me? Of course. Thanks, Kim Charlotte. Uh, my name is Lee Wood. Um, I'm the team lead of the CAR T trials uh, team at UCLH. So I work very closely with, uh, with Claire and, and Sarah, giving these, uh, these therapies to our patients. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely to have you as well. Thank you to all of you for giving uh, up your time this afternoon. So, um, First thing we're going to do is have a very short presentation from Claire, um, just talk a bit about what CAR-T therapy is, because um, not all of you listening will be 100% um, familiar with, um, with this particular treatment. So Claire, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm just so, uh, I'm searching for the uh, That's okay. slide. Alex, did yeah. you want to mention about um, uh, Amit? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so just to say that those of you who signed up to the first um, CAR-T webinar we hope to have in August um, may remember that Dr. Amit Patel was um, signed up to um, help us with that webinar. Um, he actually was a professor just shortly after we invited him actually now I remember. Um, unfortunately, um, Professor Amit passed away um, a, a couple of weeks ago, which was really um, sad to hear and we're, um, we'd just like to pass on our condolences to his family. Um, he was a really great supporter of Leukemia Care. He did so much work for us, um, gave up so much of his time um, for patients, but also for sort of widely talking to GPs and things like that. Um, stuff we we just couldn't do without support of people like him. So um, thank you, Sarah, for reminding me um, to, to mention him. How are we getting on, Claire? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much.
you're on mute if you're talking. I'm not sure if you had started yet. Um, OK, we'll try this all again. That's Here we right. go. Take two. OK, you can see some slides and you can hear a voice. Yes? I can see and hear. Perfect. Oh, excellent. All right, then. Well, so essentially a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of CAR T cell therapy for B cell cancer. So quite generic introduction um, for those who perhaps um, haven't necessarily thought too much about CAR T cells previously. So effectively, when chemotherapy and radiotherapy um, no longer are effective uh, for, for, for blood cancers, um, we have to come up with alternative solutions. And um, researchers have been working long and hard to use effectively the power of the immune system to try and fight cancer. Because of course, we know that immune cells, um, there's a component within the immune cells called T cells that are killer cells and they kill infections and they kill um, infected tissues. Um, so work has been going on for many years to try to redirect the potency, if you like, of these um, virus and infection killing cells towards cancer. Um, and so this originally uh, came to the fore uh, in the, the context of virus associated lymphomas, so solid blood cancers, um, where researchers recognized that if you had a lymphoma that was associated with a virus, so an infection driven lymphoma, if you like, what you could do was you could take virus recognizing immune cells from within the blood of those patients and you could grow them up in the laboratory to huge big numbers. And if you then infuse them back into the patient, well, because the lymphoma was driven by a virus, potentially those immune T cells against the virus might kill the lymphoma. Um, and this is just an example. This is the throat of a patient who had a virus driven lymphoma. You can see this sort of white patch at the back here, which is abnormal lymphoma tissue. And after the researchers gave this patient these virus directed immune cells, you can see that that lymphoma disappeared. So in the sense, there's a sort of a, there's a, a theory already emerging that immune cells can recognize and kill cancer cells. And the same applies in the, the solid cancers like multiple um, or metastatic um, melanoma um, and small cell lung cancers, for instance, where if you take a biopsy from the tumor itself, there's lots of immune cells within it, and you can grow those up in the laboratory, and a proportion of those cells can recognize the cancer and kill it. And you can see this example here. This is a CAT scan of somebody's liver with a big fat lump of melanoma in it. And this is a, a lump under the skin in that same patient. And after they had these immune cells that were isolated from the cancer, taken from within the actual lump of, of cancer and grown in the laboratory, you can see that they can actually shrink those tumors down. So the immune system can fight cancer. But the problem is that the immune system, when it's unmanipulated, it doesn't often recognize cancer. And in fact, most of our bodies are designed to try to quieten down the immune response because we don't want our immune systems to recognize our own, our own tissues because that could lead to all sorts of problems with autoimmunity. Um, and in fact, although this, these therapies I've mentioned before are relevant for some cancers, it's not a panacea and it's not effective across the board. So to take this technology further, or to take this hypothesis further, and to give these sorts of immune therapies more potency and more direction, researchers then looked at trying to redirect these cells using clever gene engineering technology to, to, to allow those immune T cells to recognize cancers. Um, and so this is where um, we come into the picture and this is where chimeric antigen receptors um, T cells come into the picture. Um, so what you do is you, in this case, take a blood sample from a patient, you take all those immune T cells out, the same cells that recognize viruses. But what you then do is you introduce a new gene into those cells. And we have ways of doing that in the lab where you can use these safety modified viruses to introduce a new piece of DNA into your immune cell. And then that immune cell makes a protein that it's never made before, um, called a CAR in this situation. And that little CAR protein makes its way onto the surface of the immune T cell in, in multiple numbers. 
And those CAR T cells can then be infused into the patient to go and target the tumor. And this is what a CAR looks like. And for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is actually a pretty simple structure. It's on the surface of an immune T cell here. This little bit at the surface outside the cell, it binds to your tumor. And when this binds to your tumor cell, it sends a big strong signal into the immune T cell, telling that immune T cell, first of all, to kill, and second of all, to grow. And so these cells, when they get that signal from binding the tumor, they grow and they become killer cells. And that's effectively how they, they, they work when they get infused um, or when they're injected into the patient. And this is a little cartoon that um, one of our colleagues, Martin Poulet, puts together. He sees all immune cells like little mini robots that can be reprogrammed and computerized and manipulated to really do whatever you ask them to do, uh, including target cancer. Um, and in terms of CD19, so we've, um, again, we're talking about leukemia today and specifically B cell leukemia. And we know that there's a protein on the surface of this leukemia called CD19, and there's lots and lots of it on the leukemia cells. And it is, it's a great target for CAR T cells because this CD19, it isn't really expressed on other tissues. So you don't find lots of CD19 on the heart or in the lungs or in the, the, in the gut, for instance. So it means that the CAR T cell therapy isn't going to cause all these horrible side effects in the heart, the lung, the, the, the colon, et cetera. It's very specifically expressed um, on the, the B cells, um, in, including the leukemia. Um, and again, this is a sort of a complicated plot to look at, but what this is, this is called the Kaplan-Meier curve for those who haven't seen one of these before. And what this is, is showing is um, patients who are recruited onto a study um, who receive a treatment and how they do or how, how, many, um, how many of those patients will um, do well with the treatment and survive after the treatment. And, and what this trial was, this is a trial that Sarah knows a lot about, um, it's, it's, a, it's a trial of CAR T cell therapy um, that was pioneered at the University of Pennsylvania um, over in the US, um, where they used something called CTL019, probably one of the first um, second generation CARs to be used in children and young adults with relapsed uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a group of patients who didn't have any other treatment options. And what was remarkable about this was the fact that when patients received this treatment, well, first of all, 93% of those patients who've relapsed after every other treatment you can imagine achieve a complete response when they're reassessed at month one. And then what's even more impressive about this is the fact that there's a significant proportion of these patients who stay in remission. And they've got approximately 50% of patients are still in remission up to 12 months and beyond. So this is not something, I guess, that's been seen with other therapies, and that's what makes it really exciting. Um, and of course, you know, the media have been very uh, quick to um, take a hold of this story, and there's been lots of um, articles in the newspapers about it. And again, the poster child for this therapy is Emily Whitehead. And this is one of the sort of the first patients to be treated at the University of Pennsylvania, and her sort of torrid time with her stem cell transplant, where all the treatments weren't working for her. And then she had this CTL019, this sort of um, CD19 targeting CAR T. And they do this really nice piece where they, you know, have her followed up every year and, and six years cancer free. So, you know, the, these sorts of responses, I guess, with conventional treatments after patients have failed transplant and so on, they just didn't exist 10 years ago. And of course, off of the back of this, these studies. And um, we're very fortunate now to be able to access um, Pisogen McClusal or Kimraya, as most people will know it, a CD19 targeting car um, across the world and also in the UK. And um, Sarah has lots of patients at Great Ormond Street um, and in other areas of the UK being treated with this treatment. Um, and of course, there's lots of CAR T cell centres in the UK that are delivering. Um, these sorts of treatments to teenagers, young adults, and pediatric patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And there's a um, significant um, other population of patients with lymphoma or solid lumps of um, B cell cancers um, that are receiving um, these, these cells um, in the adult setting. 
And I suppose one of the things maybe Sophie will talk a little bit about is her experience of what it's like to have these therapies. You know, is it safe? And of course, we all know that um, you know, CAR T cell therapy, so it's an immune therapy. Um, so again, you can expect the sorts of side effects that you might feel if you had an infection or a flu. Um, and in the case of patients, often a sort of a septic episode um, with high fevers and feeling very shivery and unwell. And of course, these CAR T cells, because they're like living drugs going around in your bloodstream, it can make you, it can manifest as lots of different side effects affecting all of your um, organs in your body. Um, this is just a case history of someone who received CAR T cell therapy for um, a lymphoma. Um, and they received um, their cells on, they call it day zero. Um, and within 24 hours of those cells, this patient had a fever of 39.5 degrees. And then on the, sec the, the day after the CAR T cells were given, they dropped their blood pressure and they needed lots of therapies to help um, support them through that, um, that, that, that side effect, that cytokine release syndrome. Um, and then they got this other side effect that can sometimes be observed in CAR T cell therapy, which is um, neurotoxicity or irritation of the brain. And often our patients that manifests as an inability to write very clearly, um, sometimes with disorientation and a bit of tremor. In fact, that's just an example of what the writing, um, how it deteriorated by day five in that patient. You can see it becomes illegible. And that sort of neurotoxicity profile, that, 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 that that's, um, pathology, if you like, is reversible. Um, and it just reflects the inflammation at, um, whenever the CAR T cells are expanding inside the patient. And it's something that we see quite commonly, but as I mentioned, it is reversible. And this is the sort of potency of CAR T cells in solid phase B cell cancers. You can see these are lumps of lymphoma, which by day 30 have disappeared. So I guess we have to conclude that immunotherapy is here to stay. CAR T cell therapy is here to stay. And for relapsed and refractory leukemia, certainly in the pediatric and young adult setting and lymphomas in the adult setting. Um, and we're very fortunate that NHS England have licensed these therapies for our patients. And that, of course, these therapies are not without toxicity, but uh, a significant proportion of our patients actually can achieve long-term responses following a single dose. And it's really the beginning of the journey. And I suppose we, Sarah and myself and Lee and all the teams, we're working as our global researchers to try and make these treatments more effective, better tolerated, um, and more applicable to more patients and more cancers. And these are just some thoughts on the future um, of cellular immunotherapy. So many different things that we're currently looking into to try and improve um, and refine our treatments. So thanks very much for listening. I hope that's been a reasonable introduction. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I had one follow-up question that I think might be useful to define at this point, based on your last slide, actually. Um, you preempted my question slightly, but mm. could you just explain the difference between the terms cellular therapies that people go around exactly CAR-T? is? It, uh, my understanding is that CAR-T is a type of cellular therapy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. There's lots of different cellular therapies. I mean, the, you know, you, as I mentioned in the early part of the talk, you can have unmanipulated cell therapies. So, for instance, if you had, uh, you know, a virus associated lymphoma, potentially you could have virus specific T cells to try to target that. Or if you've got a solid tumor, you can sometimes extract the T cells from that tumor and receive tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy or TIL therapy. Um, but within the kind of we, we've obviously moved more, um, certainly within haematology, towards um, gen gene engineered approaches to allow us to refine the targeting mm -hmm. and, and to potentially improve the, the effect of our, our, our therapies. And that's where CARs come in to the fore. Perfect. Thank you. I think that explains that perfectly. Um, I think that brings us nicely on to an introduction from Sarah, just a bit of a talk about. <laughs> where we've come in the UK specifically, if we can. So the first few trials I think you were uh, involved with at GOSH, could you maybe say a little bit more about what happened with that, those first few trials on CAR-T and um, how far you think we've come since then? 
<laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to, to participate. Um, so I'm a consultant at Great Ormond Street and I uh, look after children with leukaemia having CAR T cell therapy. And um, Claire and I work within the sort of academic framework at UCL trying to innovate and bring new studies to the fore to try and make CAR T cells better and better. Um, and so, yeah, so it happened that the, the sort of um, CAR T clinical studies in the UK was sort of born out of very early designs in 2014 that we rolled out at Great Ormond Street. Um, but I think it's just worth mentioning that those and um, that initial study wasn't all that effective, but it really paved the way for what subsequently came. So scientists at the UCL campus were working on new designs of CAR T cell therapies, and they've been taken forward subsequently in studies that Claire and I have been running and that we hope will sort of go beyond um, our subject areas and our disease areas into other disease areas as well. And, and Claire will hopefully be able to give an update on very exciting um, sort of progression in that direction to new disease entities and, and also myself in a different direction. So um, I think it's worth just remembering that when you start the journey um, on innovating, um, what can be a very promising therapy, sometimes the first iterations don't work, but we need to put those out there um, in order that it benefits the whole community because ultimately we learn so much from those studies and the science moves forward and then we can quit move quickly to sort of incorporate new designs into our studies and, and go forward so it's really useful sometimes to look back on on that context um because sometimes it seems that CAR T cell therapy is just a magic bullet it's going to come in and it's going to save everyone and unfortunately in certain disease settings it may be less effective and we have to learn about why that is okay. and, yeah sorry carry on <laughs> I just wanted to um, so I, I I have also put some slides together um, in relation to sort of explaining new directions in CAR T cell therapy and um, just in a very general way and I thought that might be helpful. Yes, perfect. Thank you. I think I've given you permission to share your screen so um should be able to just go ahead. Yep, I'm just oh, here it is. Okay, can you see that on the full screen? Yep, I can see that fine. fine thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, so essentially, just to recapitulate, um, we the chimeric antigen receptor is based on antibody technology, and in a really simplistic way, it's like putting the glasses on an immune cell so that it can now see the cancer and fight the cancer. Okay. But um, licensed CAR T cell treatments are really effective for advanced BALL in children, and we're hoping that that will also come out in adults soon, hopefully early next year or halfway through next year. But um, in the context of what we know is really, really um, sort of effective CAR T cell therapy, as Claire highlighted, we know that ultimately just um, under half of patients are cured long term. So if you look at the patients sitting having their infusions, at the end of the first year, only half of them will be cured and, and, and not need further treatment. So we're not really there yet in terms of um, having the final um, sort of uh, design that we think will be the answer to everything in terms of even BALL, where there's an established benefit. So some of the challenges Claire's highlighted, um, this is a toxic treatment, and we can consider ways that we can reduce the toxicity, both in terms of the way that we engineer our CAR T cells, the chimeric antigen receptor itself, and um, other treatments that we give alongside the CAR T cells to help with that. Um, we need to understand in BALL particularly, we know that persistence of the CAR T cells is really important and can reduce the need for additional treatment, but the CAR T cells don't hang around long-term in all patients. Um, so uh, the first patient that Claire mentioned has still got CAR T cells ongoing even after treatment in 2015, but many of my patients will lose their CAR T cells within the first year, and that's, um, that confers an increased relapse risk. We really need to understand the biology of around how CAR T cells work, and that's why studies are so important, because we can learn so many lessons by, by um, taking the CAR T cells back out of patients and looking really carefully at their characteristics to understand what they are doing in the body and how they do that. We want to try and reduce relapse rates, and that's a very important aspect that I'll speak about in a second. Um, in some countries, we need to improve access. So we're very lucky in the UK that we've got access to CAR T cell therapies on the NHS, but in other countries, that's not the case. Um, and access also depends on the feasibility of getting to the treatment. So you need to be able to take the patient. Their disease needs to not completely progress so rapidly that you can't deliver the treatment for them, or they may get side effects on the way um, to getting their CAR T cells. That means they never actually get there. So access has got a number of different aspects. And again, that's um, uh, sort of areas that we can consider. And then there's developing CAR T cell therapies for other leukemias and other cancers. 
So just to put it really simplistically, I've got this cartoon here. If you imagine this is how I um, sort of describe to children what um, my research uh, areas of interest are, you can take your CAR T cells, um, but you might want to think about what superhero powers you want to give your CAR T cells to make them do the job more effectively. And we've actually generated a CAR T cell game where the children can add a superhero power to their CAR T cells shown in blue, and they can have a killer death ray, which means that as a CAR T cell goes to kill tumor cells, it can actually kill tumor cells further away from itself. Um, they can clone themselves more rapidly, and that means that there's more CAR T cells to go and fight the leukemia. And we can also give them a longer um, lifespan so they live longer and therefore can last in the body longer to do the job. And you can see how that highlights some of the um, themes that I've already mentioned. Okay, so um, just to highlight on the CARPAL study, um, which was one of the studies that we're running at Great Ormond Street, and Claire's got a very related study that's treating adults um, uh, at UCLH. And we take study patients and we look at their CAR T cells after they've been infused. In some patients, up to five years later, we isolate them and then we can look really carefully to see what's going on. Are they living longer because they've lasted out to five years? Are they able to clone themselves more rapidly? Or did they have other special killing powers that we need to try and, and, and understand more? more keenly and so that's part of our research. I mentioned that um, we, we desperately need to try and uh, extend CAR T cell therapy to other disease settings. So on the right hand side is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but on the left hand side is acute myeloid leukemia. And at the moment, um, we don't have an effective or licensed CAR T cell therapy for acute myeloid leukemia, but we're all trying very hard to, to, to generate that and to um, create studies that will enable us to learn how best to deliver a CAR T cell treatment for acute myeloid leukemia. And you can see that under the microscope, they actually look very similar, but they're biologically they're very different and CAR T cell therapy in AML may take us a lot longer to be um, effective because of many different reasons. Oops. Is that the end of my, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so, so in terms of um, discussing um, studies, we've discussed the sort of um, innovations that are needed to make CAR T cells safer and also to make them more effective. And just to highlight one other thing, um, which was brought up around here with this slide, this is my reminder slide for that. So when we make CAR T cells, we effectively put glasses on them so they can recognize the leukemia. And Claire talked about CD19, which is the target um, that the glasses allow CAR T cells targeting ALL to C. But sometimes the leukemia can evolve so that that molecule is no longer present on the surface of its cells. And effectively, it's like taking the glasses off the CAR T cells. So one of the projects that we've got ongoing at the moment is to bring in another CAR onto the surface of the cell. So each cell's got two CARs that can help it recognize and fight leukemia. And we want to understand if that prevents relapse um, uh, as well. So there's a number of different sort of directions for innovation in this area, and we're all working really hard to try and understand what we can do to make CAR T cell therapy better, more applicable, and um, uh, accessible more widely for patients with other forms of leukemia. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Surprising how much there's still to do, given um, that it's already approved in some indications. I think that's really, really interesting. And look, um, I'm sure we can come back to some specific. Uh, some people have already asked about certain advances already, but I want to introduce the other two speakers before we come back to those questions. So I'm sure we can come back to this very shortly. I'm struggling to. Oh, so it's <laughs> I, there you go. I was going to say I could do it for you, but all sorted. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Lee, I wanted to bring you in at this point, if I may. Um, so we've talked a lot about the science so far of CAR T, how they work and, um, and, and where we're going next with them. Um, but I wondered whether you could say a little bit about what the process is like to have CAR T and then also your role, um, because um, I don't think everybody will be familiar with clinical trial practitioners. So maybe you could say a little bit more about what you do as well for us. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, Thanks. Let me start with that. I suppose I've got a weird role. So I'm a trial practitioner. I, I run the team at UCLH who, who runs these trials. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, though I, I do have colleagues who are nurses, so I'm just, a, I'm just here. I've um, got a science background. Um, but it's, it's, it's a huge privilege to kind of work with you know, amazing people uh, like Claire and Sarah in terms of running these studies. Now, so day to day, what it means is fundamentally, I need to make sure that a patient's in the same room as a doctor and all their scans and their bone marrow is there, else is booked as well as kind of generally coordinating the trials. So that means opening it, make sure, make sure it's safe and make sure it's closed quickly. It's always kind of logistics. A lot of it's quite dull, frankly, uh, even though it sounds very exciting. Um, but that's kind of the, the general thing. 
And it's the, the key thing we need to do is um, what we're asking in research really is so three things. One is, is this treatment safe? That's often the first question you ask. So are we doing um, harm by giving it to somebody? And hopefully the answer is no. Uh, the second question we tend to answer is, um, does it work? Of course, that's uh, the, the big thing one though, is does it work? So, and if we've established that it's safe and established that it works, the third question we ask is, if there's something else available for this thing, this disease, um, is this new thing we've got, which is safe and it works, is it better than that? Um, so that's what, how sort of the, the different phases of clinical trials develop. And that's the question we ask. Um, now, in our work, CAR-T, most of the work tends to be at the start, which is, is it safe? But at the same time, we're also asking, is it, is it working? So that's where uh, me and my team um, uh, do that. Now, the team itself is quite big. We've got about 10 members of staff. We've got, we look at have one of the biggest uh, some CAR-T portfolios in, in Europe. Um, we, we deal with a huge amount of uh, different indications of, of cancer. And what's really exciting is uh, two things about that. Is on the one hand, um, we're tr treating more uh, cancers and, and other diseases than we can be treated with current available therapies on the NHS. So we're able to offer our patients and patients refer to us uh, therapies which hopefully are safe and curative that are otherwise not available to to anybody. So that's a really exciting thing to, to offer those therapies to, to patients. And the other thing, as, as uh, Sarah and Claire alluded to, is that we're sort of contributing to the body of science, which even if the answer is um, a negative, i.e. this doesn't work, we still contribute to the, the overall um, uh, research, which tells us about CAR-T and about CAR-T therapies and cell therapies and how to drive it forward. Because what's remarkable about CAR-T is how quickly uh, it's developed and how quickly it's changed. So if, I've worked here for six years, um, and during that time we've seen CAR-T go from research to being on the NHS. I think we'll see that happen again with some of our therapies here. And that's an incredibly quick process to change a lot of people's lives. So it's extraordinary uh, to be part of it. Um, in terms of the sort of the pathway of CAR-T and how it works to the patients, um, it's a quite a long process compared to what you have for a standard chemotherapy. Um, it's a long process because every single CAR-T therapy is made bespoke for each person. It's not an off-the-shelf medication. So the, the process, once you've established a patient eligible, um, which means are they fit to, to get CAR-T, uh, is the best thing for them, is there better alternatives, and establishing that it, it, it's the right fit for them. We then do something called a apheresis or harvest, and this is a, a blood draw uh, where we take out the patient's white cells, which is basically the starting material to make CAR-T cells. So we're taking the T cells from the patient. It's a sort of four hour procedure, which is quite straightforward. It's an outpatient procedure. Uh, and then the cells go to a lab in either down the road in North London, to Gosh, uh, to Stevenage or to America, depending on uh, who we're working with. And then the, then the, the CAR-T cells are made and that's been already discussed uh, already. Um, that process takes quite a while. It's often somewhere between three to six weeks to manufacture CAR-T cells. It's not a simple process. Um, it's a very costly process. And again, this is just for one patient cells. Uh, and at the end of that process, when the cells are very made and we're absolutely certain that they're, they're both going to work when they're given back to the patient and they're safe to give back, the patient comes back and they're admitted to hospital um, where they get a short course of chemotherapy to, um, to get them ready for the CAR T cell and then they get the CAR T cells infused. Um, the chemotherapy tends to be comparatively light compared to other therapies because it's not designed to fight leukemia or lymphoma but it's designed to uh, prepare the body. Um, so the, the metaphor I often use is, imagine a, a field full of grass. If you want to plant some seeds, you need to first of all, get rid of the grass to make space for the incoming seeds. And then you want to fertilize the ground as well. So those seeds will grow better. And that's basically what the, the chemotherapy does. It prepares the body, makes space for the CAR-T. And when the CAR-T goes in, it helps them grow and um, multiply. Uh, and then CAR-T is infused. It's normally one infusion. Uh, and then we, that's it, that's the end of the treatment effectively. And we sit down and watch them uh, very closely on the ward for a few weeks and make sure that uh, if side effects occur, we can deal with them uh, and they're close by. And once we're happy this the cancer is recovered and we're happy the, the risk of side effects from CAR-T has, has gone, we send them home. And then we monitor them, uh, well, we monitor them for 15 years, actually, long term. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of general process in a, in a nutshell. It's more as uh, Sophie will probably uh, explain
it can get more complicated than that, but uh, that's the general overview. Perfect, thank you. I think we're slowly sort of bringing it to life as each speaker goes on. We talked about the science and then and you've just really uh, nicely outlined sort of the, the process that a patient has to actually go through. Um, I wonder before we move on to Sophie, um, if you wouldn't, it's quite a challenging question probably, but Sarah's mentioned a lot of um, innovations that need to happen or are currently being looked at in CAR-T. Is there a particular one for you that you think needs more research in particular? Uh, yeah, it's right. yeah, challenging question. I mean, I think, as we've said, the, the key thing is, I, I spoke about, I suppose that there's two directions research is going in at the moment, two key directions um, that's happening. So one is more indications. So, you know, it, we know it works in half of people with um, pediatric leukemia and or lymphoma. So I suppose on the one hand, can we treat more people? So myelomas, internal lymphomas, adult leukemias, solid tumors. There's a lot of more tumors that, that you know, there's low hanging fruit, which are uh, other lymphomas and adult leukemias. And then there's the more difficult uh, uh, treat, um, diseases like solid tumors. So can we treat more and more um, diseases as effectively uh, as we've treated um, leukemias and lymphomas? So that's, that's one question. The other question is, um, all of the currently licensed therapies are licensed for normally two or more prior lines. So patients have failed conventional chemotherapy, and then they really have they've run out of options, and therefore that's where CAR T comes in. So when we talk about the numbers of, um, of how effective CAR T has been in some of these patients, so you know, a 40 to 50 percent um, rate of uh, good response, we're talking about some of the hardest possible uh, diseases to be treated in some of the most difficult patients, um, not personally, but in terms of uh, in their disease. And so actually, that makes the numbers even more remarkable, that these are the people who have run out of options. So a very good question to ask, and has been asked in our trials here uh, across the world, is if we give CAR-T earlier in that pathway, so after maybe they failed one line rather than several, is it more effective? Is it better than the current treatment? Um, can we get them into remission earlier? Um, and also, is it less toxic than some of the chemotherapy currently available? So that's kind of the, the questions we're kind of asking at the moment. And then also, I suppose, the, the other thing is the, the, what we've already done, um, can we do it better? Can uh, we treat the current diseases? Can we get a better response rate? And can we also improve the safety? Because it's one thing just to say, again, so if you can talk to this, it's one thing to say this patient got into remission, but if that was a horrible, torrid time in, in an ICU for three weeks, uh, which led to long-term side effects, that's a very different thing to saying they sat in a bed for two weeks and were absolutely fine, they got, they got bored. Uh, so I think we want the latter rather than the former. Um, and it's important to be able to capture that and aim for a less toxic CAR-T. Great, thank you. Um, we certainly come back to some of those scenarios. I think a few people have asked um, um, a few questions related to that, but I'm very keen to hear a bit more from Sophie before we, before we do. Sophie, like I said, we've heard about the science and now we've heard about the process. So put a human face on it, if you like, for us. Um, how, how was this um, process of CAR-T for you? Um, so for me, it started initially after my stem cell transplant. So I had a pretty rough time with transplant. Um, I was very unwell and it was a very bad time. Um, and I just remember getting my day 100 bone marrow biopsy done after my transplant. And I had a couple of other friends who were also having transplant around the same time. And a couple of weeks after that, I got a letter in the post asking for me to come in for a repeat. So I sort of asked my friends, like, have any of you had this like letter in the post? And they were like, no. And I was like, oh, OK, like maybe it was just a bad sample or, you know, something simple because no one had sort of mentioned to me that it could be anything more. Um, so I, you know, went off, had this biopsy done and a couple of weeks later I went in and uh, my consultant sort of sat me down and he just looked at me and went, well, where are your parents? Because I was with my sister. And I was like, I just knew like it was going to be bad news. And he said, yeah, you have relapsed. And I was like, okay, I was like chemo then. Um, just trying to be pretty like blase about it. But he just like said, well, chemo is not really going to touch you this time. And I was like, oh, okay. And um, because we have quite a good relationship, he knows my background with my undergraduate degree um, because I was studying biology. He lo just looked at me and said, you know what car is, don't you? And I was like, yeah. And uh, he actually said, you know how expensive it is, don't you? And I was like, yeah. And um, he said, well, I think this is probably the route that we're going to have to go down. So this was in April 2019. Um, and from then, it was 
it was a bit of a waiting game at the beginning because they needed an immediate repeat bone marrow biopsy because I didn't quite fit the criteria in regards to the amount of disease that I had. Um, so we did that straight away. And then it was just sort of a, a waiting period of trying to get the Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham signed off to actually administer the treatment um, to stop me from having to go down to London or Manchester, Bristol, etc. cetera. Um, so it did get signed off. Um, I found out, I think it was the following week that I'd been like accepted um, to have the treatment. And then um, I had my cells collected I think it was the end of April and then there was that so there was a period of sort of bridging and steroids and to keep me going and um, but I didn't feel a lot terribly but I did notice that the symptoms that I was originally diagnosed with had started to sort of seep back in without me realizing so like headaches and a bad neck and things like that which were telltales for me that something was going wrong um that I didn't quite realize were happening um so I had my cells collected um my apheresis was actually a bit more like eight to nine hours long because my veins are very bad um so it did take a while but thankfully the team were amazing and they they kept me entertained for all that time um so they were collected and sent off and I received my cells back the day after my 21st birthday so they admitted me on my birthday um and the chemotherapy before that though I was lucky enough to be able to have that as an outpatient because I lived so close to the hospital so it was nice to be able to sort of go home at the end of every day and you know get a bit more time to prepare and it was really hard for me because I didn't actually have anyone to ask any questions to who wasn't a doctor like I didn't have any patients who were my age who I could sort of ask like simple things like will I lose my hair again will it be as bad as transplant because I really did go in blind and it was pretty scary to think that I'd been through such a traumatic time with transplant and not knowing what was coming. But it was just one of those things like you just take each day as it comes. Um, obviously, my family were very supportive. And um, we got to the uh, infusion day and it was just this tiny little bag. And I was like, is that it? And they were like, yeah, that's it. That's all it is. And um, had the infusion. And I said to my doctor, well, what now? And he just said, well, we'll just wait. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, well, I was like, but what if I don't have a reaction? And he was like, oh, some people don't. And in my mind, I was thinking, I really want to have one so I know that something is working and something's happening. Um, so it did take a couple of days. I think on the fourth day, I was sitting with my sister and I said to her, I said, I feel a bit hot. And um, we got someone to do my temperature and I did have a uh, spot temperature and we were all sitting there like something's definitely happening. Um, and then over the next couple of days, I did have some trouble with my blood pressure. It did go pretty low. And um, because of the amount of times uh, the nurses had to keep coming into me on the ward, they did send me down to ICU. But it was just for monitoring purposes, only for 24 hours. So it was pretty, you know, um, relaxed for me. And then by the time I'd been given a couple of doses of tocilizumab, I probably butchered that, but <laughs> that's the best I can say. Um, I had a couple of doses of that and that sorted it all out I had no neurological issues and I was discharged after day 10 and then I was just sort of in and out clinic a couple of times a week and um, having bloods just to check on my counts because my platelets kept going pretty low for a while and so I had a couple of um, transfusions and then we did the day 30 bone marrow and two weeks later we found out that I was in complete remission and I have been ever since so, you know, it's allowed me to do so much. I've, I've, I managed to get back to university within three months of having the treatment. And I always say to people, it's so strange because after feeling ill for so long, like during, you know, trans, the stem cell transplant and other treatments, it's actually so strange to be able to like say to someone, I do actually feel genuinely better now. Like it's, it's a really strange feeling after so long of being unwell, but I did genuinely feel better after having the treatment. That's really interesting. Thank you, Sophie, for putting that perspective. I think it'd be good um, just to talk a bit more about the difference bet uh, between this and, and having a transplant. And I'll come to other guys for some, some clinical viewpoints on this. But I, I just I think people um, that are diagnosed with leukemia are probably more familiar with a transplant um, as a process. Um, yeah, just say a little bit more about how it was different for you in terms of the side effects, how long you were in hospital for, that sort of thing. I think that would really help. Yeah, yeah, of course. So with um, my transplant, 
I think immediately it was the radiotherapy that really um, knocked me off my feet and I wasn't I wasn't prepared for the way that it was going to affect me in terms of sickness and, um, you know, the um, mucositis and not being able to eat. Like I did, lo- I did lose a dramatic amount of weight in a really short period of time. Um, I couldn't keep anything down, including tablets. I was, I think, I was on every single anti-sickness that they could possibly give me, and it still wasn't enough. Um, and it was just a really like horrible, horrible time. Um, with transplant and I'm sure a lot of people have similar experiences with that and the recovery was so long and you know like painful with the sickness and the remaining mucositis that lasted for quite a long time and I was also in hospital for that for about four weeks but I do think when I look back now I was probably let home a bit too early um, because I was so unwell after, I, you know, I ended up in hospital a few times afterwards as well um, with complications and infections. And and it really just, you know, it takes it out of you. And you, you just don't feel like yourself during that period. Um, so when I'd relapsed so soon afterwards, it was just that thought of I've got to go through all, all of that again. Um, obviously, with not knowing much about CAR-T, like in terms of a patient experience, it was pretty scary to go into. But I sort of tried to like keep myself calm and thinking like surely it can't be as bad as that was because that has to have been the worst it could be um for me like personally um so when we sort of found out about Carty I've always been quite you know a positive person um so I did go into it like very open-minded very just easy going and just take each day as it came and to think that I didn't really have I didn't have any major you know bad feelings like it was that just sort of you know I'm in hospital for 10 days and that's okay like there was nothing that I really felt there was no doubt that I really felt very ill or like or just a little bit tired but nothing out of the ordinary and to be discharged after 11 days and actually be able to get up and walk around my own house whereas after transplant I pretty much couldn't move off the sofa it was just unreal to be able to kind of have my life look back and a little bit and have a little bit more control over what's going on whereas with transplant everything is totally out of control and you know it's very unpredictable what's going to happen whereas with CAR-T for me it was very like oh look is this what it feels like to actually feel normal for once and it was just such an amazing difference. It's really interesting thank you. I wonder whether Sarah and Claire, you could comment on whether that's sort of a typical experience. Because I'm assuming you see quite a few people post transplant who are then going into CAR T, much like Sophie, because of where it's approved in the NHS at the moment. I don't know whether Sarah, you wanted to comment first. Is that a typical thing that transplant is usually more unpleasant than CAR T? So the side effects of CAR T therapy can be very severe, but they're very acute and short term. And most patients have fully gotten over those within a couple of weeks. Um, although there are some other complications that can last longer, um, they're often much more manageable. Um, and, and we talk to patients so that they're, they're prepared for those um, and they involve a bit more sort of hospital visits and things. Um, but the, sort of the action and the activity that goes on and the things that most people get scared about and that we get scared about happen very quickly. And with really good supportive care, we can get patients through in the vast majority of cases. Um, um, the sort of, yeah, the treatment related um, death is really, really extremely, extremely rare compared to things like transplant, where that's a, you know, a, a, a given number that you'll get um, as part of the consenting process for transplant. What I would say um, is that although CAR-T therapy probably only is a final therapy for under half of patients, what I would say is that in the time after their CAR-T cell therapy, before they've lost CAR-T cells, which may then contribute to needing further treatment, or before they get a relapse, those patients are in a really, really good clinical shape, certainly in the paediatric setting, and Claire can speak to the adults. And I repeatedly get families telling me how the children are back to the way they were before diagnosis. So we're talking about before frontline therapy, um, better than they were in maintenance. And they really, really are able to get back to a much more normal life. Some of the patients that we've treated have been um, you know, extensively debilitated um, we've taken patients who couldn't walk because of ICU stays, because of complications from their relapse treatment. And 
the, the CAR T therapy has given them a platform for recovery and that recovery is really meaningful. So I'm really heartened by that because although I know that many of our patients will need to go on to have further therapy, until they do, they're in a really good place for, to recover and to regroup and to go back to being the people they were before this started. Got it, thank you. Claire, anything to add from your perspective on that topic? Well, I, I think I, I generally agree. Uh, much more predictable set of side effects for the most part, certainly in the leukemia patients. And yeah, the ability to get back. I mean, Sophie already mentioned that you need the old pool of platelets and maybe a, a unit of blood now and again. And we find that a reasonable number of our patients do need monitoring for their blood counts to help support them for the first little while. Um, and there might, you know, there's the old patient who gets an infection and needs to be admitted for that because of low white blood cells. Again, that's all part of the process. Some, sometimes when the cars continue to be active in the blood, that's just something that we see the blood counts can be slightly suppressed. But, but by and large, yeah, when the therapy works, um, it really is very dramatic. Charlotte, we've lost your audio. Oh, sorry. I'm using a different button to switch myself on and off. Sorry. I was just saying, um, I think um, I did have a follow up question, but I, um, I think we should answer some of the questions that come in from from those watching first because um, they're much more important than I am. So um, somebody has asked uh, about results in follicular and transformed lymphoma. Um, Claire, is this an area you cover at all? Are you able to comment on, on research in these particular types of lymphoma that the person's mentioned? Well, you know, I mean, for transformed follicular lymphoma, there's now a standard of care NHS available CAR-T. So, you know, you can come to any um, of the CAR-T centres in the UK and have that if your lymphoma has relapsed through two separate lines of treatment. So that's available. Um, and again, a bit like sort of Sarah's mentioned in the leukemia space, it's probably about 40% of patients who'll be in remission about 12 months after that therapy. And that's for transformed lymphoma. Um, for, for follicular lymphoma um, that hasn't transformed, there's a lot of research going on in this area. There's lots of clinical trials. And I mean, the results look very good. Um, it seems that CAR T cell therapy is very effective for follicular lymphoma. Um, and although the follow-up is limited, you know, it does seem that um, some of the responses, you know, they, they, they seem to be durable, as in the, the, they, the, the patients don't lose their response necessarily. But as I said, it's over a sort of short-term follow-up, so six and 12 months. But lots of patients achieve remission with CAR T cell therapy for follicular lymphoma. And within the short follow-up, um, you know, those responses can be maintained looking at the studies. So it'll be important for us all to follow up on that and, um, you know, when the studies finally report and see exactly how safe and effective it is for follicular, but very promising. Thank you. They've um, asked for a comparison to leukemia, but I was wondering whether that would be difficult to answer because of what you said about short follow up in the limb, this, in certain lymphomas. Um, are you able to make a comparison between how it's gone in leukemia in terms of survival versus lymphoma. Is there a difference or does the blood cancer type not really make much difference? I think it's very hard to make like cross disease comparisons like that and um, where there's lot of different products being used and mm -hmm. um, you know, different disease, different populations. So it's sort of hard to say, but certainly, you know, watch this space. I think follicular lymphoma is going to declare itself um, as you know, one of the next indications for CAR T that will be supported, presumably through the NHS and um, in the way that high grade lymphoma and leukemia have been. Perfect, thank you. And um, another question, I think that was aimed directly at you as a result of your um, presentation. Someone uh, was asking if you could clarify CAR T. They um, wondered if it's only available in virus related cancers, but I think you were talking about that as the, being the beginning of CAR T rather than where we are now. Is that right? Yeah, it was just, I suppose it was just to try and illustrate the point that, you know, um, the immune system has got the capability to eradicate cancer. And I suppose, you know, where the field started off, you know, these observe these clinical observations, what if, you know, it's a virus driven cancer, immune systems reject infections, but what if, you know, you, you could, you know, almost 
repurpose those cells for different for different indication. And it's this it's it's this sort of evolution in ideas and building incrementally, like Sarah mentioned in the in the CAR T field, it's incrementally building on these lessons learned. And that's why it's important for us to you know be uh, familiar with the work that's going on globally, because all of these things feed into what we're doing. We get inspired by what we read and come across and it informs what we do next. So it was more from that perspective. Okay, thank um, you. Hopefully that's clarified for, for the person who asked the question. Um, there's a question here about differences between age groups, but before we actually answer that question, Sarah, I wonder whether you could say a bit about what you know about why it started in children. Um, so especially given what we know about other treatments being fairly effective in children, um, do you know much about why sort of CAR-T was first tried in, in that group? So actually, it wasn't first tried in ALL, it was first tried in CLL. And the reason for that was because people felt that um, you were infusing a certain number of T cells and those T cells would have to replicate very quickly to catch up with the disease burden and that the disease burden in um, slower growing uh, malignancies like uh, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma might be the best places to start that investigation. And um, so the, the technology was applied to adults with CLL and some responses were seen and were reported. But then um, the patient that Claire mentioned um, was a patient who had had every single other therapy at the Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania, which was related to the adult centre, um, but was a children's hospital. And the parents said um, that they would not accept that, that she'd got to the end of the road in terms of treatment. And they urged, is there anything that you could think of that might work that hasn't been tried before? We're willing to try anything to try and save our child. And so they put to the sort of ethics committee whether it was possible to consider making the CAR T cells they're making for CLL in adults and put it and make them for this patient and, and infuse and they did um, and the families as they were pushing this agenda heavily so this was patient directed influence in sort of clinical activity and scientific activity and they were shocked to see what happened because no one anticipated that the CAR T cells could expand so rapidly that they'd be able to take on the pace of this rapidly progressive ALL that was sort of wiping their daughter away before their eyes. And that was a real lesson where you can kind of have it all on the drawing board and think you understand the biology, but sometimes you do just have to see what happens in patients to understand what the limitations are. What they noticed was the onset of very dramatic cytokine release syndrome at, a, at an intensity that would have shut down any adult study. So grade four um, sepsis-like syndrome would have been an indication to shut a study down. But because it was off study and because it was a child, she bounced back so quickly that it provided a basis. And they actually rewrote the limits of toxicity for CAR T cell studies as a result. And that direct application of a new standard um, of toxicity assessments because of the fact that she'd survived so well and bounced back from the, her very severe toxicities, then paved a way for further investigation in adults. And I can tell you that alongside that, the investigation of blinitumumab, another antibody related therapy, was being still judged on the preceding toxicity levels. And as a result of that, the dosing of blinitumumab was downgraded so that they wouldn't be hitting grade four events. But in the, in the CAR T cell field now, grade four events are considered, they wouldn't be sufficient to shut a study down. What's clear in the difference between children and adults, however, is that the toxicities do seem to be more um, greater and more severe in adults and their ability to recover and bounce back is more um, limited, unfortunately. And that means that the therapeutic window, the gap between efficacy and toxicity that's unacceptable is larger in children and provides a basis for investigation that's been really important. We've all learned so much about CAR T cell therapy, but as I say, had they been starting in adults, they may have shut the studies down completely and, and um, pharmaceutical companies may have taken it no further. So in a way, the innovation that went through in children was really important. And, and this is something I say over and over again, because sometimes um, it, it's very difficult. The paediatric setting is much smaller numbers mm. and pharmaceutical companies are less in, interested in investigating in that area because they won't get the same numbers of patients and products sold as they might do otherwise. And that has impacted on study design where children are sometimes excluded, unfortunately. 
Thank you for that and um, apologies for getting my history wrong. <laughs> um, it was really interesting. I just, I, I guess you assume when you hear all the stories about the children's education that that must have been the first. It's really interesting to hear that I had my facts wrong on that. Um, Claire, anything you wanted to add on, on the adults as someone who sort of works in these indications now? Um, I mean, I, I think the the toxicity profile, like Sarah mentions, you know, the kids are so resilient and, you know, they can tolerate these more challenging therapies with greater ease. Uh, and in adults, it's much more important that we we get that, um, we, we select our therapy more carefully. And actually, even that's a point where, you know, there's been evolution in the field, even during the short period that we've been working. So at UCL, we have this car, it's, it's essentially, it's a, um, a car that's got a special design such that whenever it binds onto the cancer cell, it does so with a sort of a slightly different pattern than some of the existing and some of the licensed cars. And what this allows it to do is it, it seems to be associated with a, a lower toxicity profile than other cars. Um, and, and what's more is because it comes off the, the leukemia cell more quickly, um, it, the, the, the T cell or the immune cell um, isn't overactivated because that's another problem that we face. Sometimes if you overactivate immune cells, they die. Um, and so, so what we've got is we've got a new design of a car that's associated with less toxicity. And actually the cells are healthier as a result. And because they're healthier as a result and they're not exhausted, they can survive for longer in the patients. Um, so that's the direction of travel. These sorts of design modifications are what's required in the adult setting to take what is extremely, it can be extremely effective therapy and to make it safer and more tolerable for patients who, you know, are older and maybe have a lot of other medical problems um, that mean they wouldn't tolerate more intensive approaches. So, you know, that work to optimize and find the sweet spot is all ongoing. Yeah, we talked a lot about optimising today, so we get mm. to see how that progresses, definitely. Um, so someone's directed this question very specifically at you, Lee, so I hope you understand the question, because I must admit I'm not sure I fully understand it. Somebody's asked, what are the clean room conditions like for the manufacturing part of the process? Um, I wondered if you could sort of give some context to the question as well as answering it for me. <laughs> sure. Well, Claire's actually better place than I am to comment on clean rooms, but it's basically referring to the manufacture of the cells. So the clean room refers to the sterile environment in which you make CAR T cells because um, it's called a closed process. So once you've got the, the white cells after the lab, they need to not get infected by any particle from the air. So you need to make sure that uh, that uh, sample bag is going to be uh, sterile and pure throughout the entire process and doesn't get infected because you make CAR T cells, but you put in E. coli plug it to the patient. So that's the clean room. Um, in, in terms of manufacturing, it, it, yeah, it makes it very expensive. Effectively. It's a very expensive therapy. There's no getting around that. I think um, hopefully in the future that may change as we get better and better. And one thing we've done um, between GOSH and, and UCLH is move from a, a manual process where there's two people basically making cells by hand to a, a more automated process where we have a machine which helps uh, helps us do that, which has both uh, made the process quicker, but also has made the process more reliable and consistent. Um, but I think alluding to the cost, the truth is, it's, yeah, it's extraordinarily expensive, but no one really knows how much it costs, specifically the NHS, because those negotiations are um, are kept secret. But I think if you were to go to America and buy a car from a company, it would cost $300,000 uh, for a bag of cells. Um, and hopefully, as time goes on, the, the virtual car, and the difference between CAR T and a lot of therapies is that you, know, you, you have a drug, normally one company owns the drug and they just they decide the price until it becomes generic. CAR T, uh, of course, every company can make its own CAR T and it can be for the exact same disease and the exact same indication and target, but they can make their own because each one is technically unique, which is why there's already several uh, available for the same diseases. Now, the benefit of this is on the one hand, um, you've got companies jostling for safe and safer cars, less toxic cars, and more efficacious cars. They're not just resting on their laurels and saying, this is good enough because they'll be outcompeted. But also hopefully down the line, and this is speculation, but in a busy you know, buyer's market, hopefully that will decrease the prices uh, and people will need to make better 
um, more efficient processes to make the car, to make them cheaper. But um, in the meantime, it's expensive. Thank you for explaining that. I think there is a lot of talk about um, the cost of CARTI, um, so it's good to contextualise that. And, and you've answered the the most recent question about will the cost come down over time, I think. Um, I wondered whether um, we could touch on, um, I think you've described quite a complicated process and um, Sophie also alluded to how she had to wait for Birmingham to become approved to deliver CARTI. Um, are, there, are there other challenges other than the cost uh, in delivering CAR T therapy, um, either through a trial or on the NHS? Is that for me? Sorry, Charlotte. Yes. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, so it's, yes. I mean, the main thing is there's a lot of uh, plates to spin. So in order, I mean, first of all, if you've got a CAR T service, you need to have hospital that can accommodate the patient having a transplant, a patient who's going to be immunosuppressed and get chemotherapy. So you need a patient, you know, experienced you know, ward with ward staff who can give cells, can monitor infection. So you need an experienced uh, group of people. So that tends to mean it's going to be a transplant centre, which limits you straight away to a handful of um, hospitals throughout the country. You then need a place, place where you can do an apheresis procedure, which isn't everywhere needs a place that can store or even process cells um, and keep them at certain temperatures, uh, which is complicated. Um, and then in the case of research, you need, you need a, a hospital which has a great support from the academic side to power that kind of innovation and the enthusiasm to run what is, again, difficult, expensive and complicated studies. Um, and that requires a lot of political will um, um, in, in a hospital. So there's a lot of reasons why it's not a straightforward process. Um, I think we've seen, as, uh, over the last few years, we've seen more and more centres throughout the country open uh, the car for licensed products, which is great because one of the things we see, we have a couple of trials at UCLH, which only run at UCLH, uh, which is nice for us, but it does mean that people have to travel hundreds of miles to get therapy, and it means they're far away from their family and from their support networks. That's also very challenging. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to have a more democratic process to have you know, cars available throughout the country. Um, but the, tr the truth is, there is certain limitations to what centres can provide car tea, um, which will be there for a while, I expect. Great, thank you. Um, Sophie, did the sort of delay while you were waiting for Birmingham to sort of become approved to deliver car tea give you some insight into how complicated the process of, of it was? Did it, did it worry you at all? That, that was happening um, I wasn't I wasn't necessarily worried I was very reassured by my team that you know they would do everything in their power to sort of get it sorted for Birmingham it was kind of a matter of um like a pen to paper situation where it just needed a little bit of a push to get the paperwork sorted out um and then I just remember going in one day for bloods and there were a lot of bottles and my veins don't play and I remember saying to the nurse like what is this for and she's like oh it's for the car tea. and I looked at my mom and I was like we've got it then um, so we sort of, it was, it was a little bit scary, but because of having such a supportive team around, like I was, I was very reassured throughout. So it wasn't too bad. And I did know that like, if it wasn't going to be sorted for Birmingham, it would be sorted for somewhere else. And that would be a bridge that we would cross when we came to it. But it sounded like from your description of what happened afterwards, you had to go into hospital a couple of times a week. It was quite a, a lot going on. Would <laughs> I guess, were you grateful for having living so close to, to somewhere where you could get all that done? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you can never predict how long you're going to be in when you're going for, for a day case for blood. Like, you never know what's going to be wrong. Some days I'd go in and I'd be in and out. Other days it would be you need blood, you need platelets, you need, a, you need to be here for practically the whole day. And so it was nice for sort of like, you know, me and, me and my mom, we would get like someone to drop us off and, and we'd phone someone when we were doing and we could you know go home to our own beds and I know that for a lot of people like having to be close to the treatment centre is hard because that often means having to be away from your family and you know I was in such a privileged position to be able to go home at the end of those long days and sleep in my own bed and you know when when you're going through treatment um like that then the simple things are all you really want to keep you going um so yeah, I was very lucky to have that option. And obviously now that a few more treatment centers are 
available around the country hopefully it means that people don't have to travel as far to their nearest centre but I understand that it is still far for a lot of people yeah agreed and um, Lee's already set out why it's, it'd be really helpful to have more more car tea places um, around the UK I agree it's a, a part of the problem um, there's another question for you Sophie specifically and um, somebody wants to know how important it was for you to know how long it would take for your cells to be ready when they went off and were you nervous and were you kept informed about that bit um yeah so uh, it was pretty important for me to know like to be fair I'm just like quite nosy with my treatment like I will just ask every question like just for my own satisfaction of knowing um but I was kept um informed like when the cells were collected I was told that it will probably be about four or five weeks um and they'd tell me when they were back and things like that and obviously I did get told that and it, it was pretty scary in that period because it's kind of like a little bit of a grey space like you're kind of thinking like well what if something happens in this time what if you know like my disease starts progressing a lot faster than we thought it would but thankfully like it was kept under control I was on a lot of I was on enough steroids a lot which was quite hard for my body but I knew that it was sort of keeping everything at bay and under control until we could get to that point. And then when you are admitted on that day, um, before your cells, for me, like I know a lot of people are admitted for their chemo, but um, when I was admitted the day before, it's finally like sort of settling in that this is going to be the thing that's going to like make everything better. Like you have to keep yourself going like that. Like obviously there's no guarantee, but to you know you have to keep thinking it to keep yourself getting through it with your family. Yeah, I'm sure it was quite a difficult time. Um, Claire, is that uh, is that the time that I don't know the, the other patients kind of come to you with with concerns? So do they find that waiting time while the long process happens quite concerning most of the time? Uh, I think, I mean, for the most part, the, the concerns are probably twofold. Uh, one is whether or not the manufacturer is going to be successful. For the most of the majority of our patients it is but there will be a small proportion who for whatever reason they don't get a good product or a product that can't be released um, and, and that creates a whole new set of problems that we have to discuss so that's the first anxiety that they have and the second anxiety I suppose relates to you know they're having this Sophie mentioned the word bridging so bridging is the kind of treatment that you have between where they harvest your t-cells and then where you come in for your car and um, it's there to hold the disease and in an ideal world to reduce it. But sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes patients progress through that. And, you know, with progression, as Sophie's mentioned, some of the symptoms, sometimes those symptoms can be quite debilitating. And actually, if the symptoms are so debilitating, you know, that the patient can't get out of bed and is unable to come to their appointments, well, there's this horrible situation where they may not even be fit enough to receive the CAR-T therapy. So, you know, patients always have these sorts of thoughts in their mind, I think, um, as they're at home and, you know, going through that process. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's an anxious time. So I totally agree with Sophie on that. Thank you. Sarah, I wondered if you had any anything to add. So I know, obviously, you're probably working more closely with the parents as someone who works with children quite a lot more. Is, is, there, is it the same concerns or do you tend to find slightly different concerns in that group? Oh, that's a really hard one and it's something which I'm sort of recognising I think we need to pay more attention to um, because the person who's often silent in that room is a smaller child and um, children become quite passive through um, very intensive treatments and, and intensive illness um, and that's just their coping strategy which we can't really, we don't, you don't want to kind of shatter their own protective mechanisms but you do realise that you sort of form a relationship with uh, parents much, much more um, and that's appropriate and it meets the needs of, of that family going through because ultimately they need to be the ones to to interact and to connect with their child. And that's a, a, the right way and that the child connects with the parents and we support the parents. And but sometimes I'm sure there are things that we miss and concerns from the children that we miss. So we've thought about creative ways that we can try and bring that out. And um, uh, I think we're talking to Leukemia Care about that going forward. Um, so yeah, so I think we I think we do need to make sure that we sort of ground ourselves in the patient experience, whatever age they are, and then make sure that we're meeting all those needs as well as those of the parents who are often quite vocal um, in this situation. 
I guess that's a good point to bring you back in, Sophie. You, you weren't obviously a, a young child when you went through this, but um, how did your your extended family, and you mentioned your sister, for example, how did they all cope with uh, the CAR-T therapy? Did they have any worries themselves? Yeah, I think the main thing was actually like not really knowing like what it involved. Um, so like my sister was with me when I'd relapsed and you know, it was a lot to kind of, I think everyone in, in the family kind of looks to me to explain to me what the doctor said. So like we'll sort of have an appointment and we'll get out and they'll say, OK, so what did that mean then? Because I know that I can sort of translate a little bit of the jargon. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty scary for all of us. There was a lot of like, you know, Googling going on um, just to try and find out a little bit more about the process and, you know, just an overview of how it worked. And, you know, when you sort of get to grips with that, it was um it was okay because we felt pretty reassured by the team that you know like I was going to be in like the best hands no matter where I ended up having the treatment it was um it was all going to be handled really well so yeah it was it was scary at first but once we knew a little bit more about it it was a bit more oh okay like a little bit more of an understanding of the process was helpful yeah I think that's really important making sure everybody understands the process and I'm sorry that you had to do the explaining there I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> that must be a little bit annoying um we've got a few more minutes left and I realize I missed a, a question earlier on apologies to the person who asked that one um oh it's a very interesting question they've said it's a lay question but I think it's fascinating um Sarah maybe this good one for you um to start on they've asked if you can uh, essentially the crux of the question is if you can tell why a CAR T therapy hasn't worked for a person can you tell whether it was the cells or whether it was a, a different part of the process that's gone wrong is that is that possible yeah so we can have a look at the characteristics of the leukemia when it comes back to find out if the CAR T cells can can see that leukemia anymore and I mentioned that one way that leukemias evolve to relapse is that they can um, mutate so that the recognition molecule is gone from the surface of the leukemia and there's a number of different ways that that can happen so if we pick that up then we know um, that even if the CAR T cells from other tests look like they're persisting that it's the loss of recognition um, and the evolution of the leukemia that's contributed to that relapse and um, we also have tests that we can do to see if the CAR T cells are persisting because as well as eliminating leukemia cells they'll eliminate healthy B cells um, and so we can look at those and we can also directly test for the CAR T cells these days. So we know um, if the CAR T cells have been lost. If the CAR T cells have been lost, we don't know why that is. Um, and that's a sort of subject of investigation. It could be because the patient had so much treatment beforehand that their T cells just weren't fit and weren't able to sort of carry on. Um, um, or potentially sometimes there are ways that you manufacture CAR T cells that we subsequently learn weren't the best and lead to short persistence, um, even though no one sets out to design it that way. Um, and then finally, there can be immune responses against CAR T cells. And we've demonstrated that both in our studies and it's also been demonstrated in other studies as well. So the immune system, you can have a perfect CAR T cell product that's doing exactly what it wants to do. But if the immune system starts recognizing the CAR T cells as foreign, they can delete the CAR T cells actively and you can lose your response as a result. And um, so, yeah, all these different mechanisms can contribute. Are you muted again, Charlotte? I'm sure there's um, still plenty of, of science. To, well, we've talked about what needs to be done. There's, there's plenty of stuff you still don't understand, despite having um, had this treatment on the NHS for a couple of years already and in trials for a lot longer. Um, let's make these two the last two questions. Um, and I'm going to put them together. And um, please feel free, panel, to not answer them if you um, aren't aware of the answers. These questions are quite challenging. But someone's asked if um, where CAR-T is going in CLL, um, I think, because you mentioned um, CLL earlier, Sarah, and also whether CAR-T is moving into non-blood cancers, which I think, Claire, you mentioned very briefly. Um, mm. If you don't feel able to comment more than that, that's absolutely fine. But um, what do you know about where CAR-T is going in those two indications? Um, maybe, Claire, you could start for me. Well, so uh, basically, a CLL, traditionally, uh, the response rates and the, the, the durability of those response rates has been less impressive than in the pediatric leukemia space and also in the adult lymphoma space. So that sort of, in a sense, it sort of slowed down progress in that in CLL. And part of the problem there is just that the, the immune cells, the T cells in those CLL patients are slightly less fit, if you like, 
um, compared to other indications. There's something about the CLL that impairs the ability of those T cells to grow. And so it means that the CAR T cell product that you make for those patients may not necessarily grow the same way it would from a patient with leukemia or with lymphoma. Again, lots of research being done to try and understand how to make those T cells better. Some groups using combinations, giving drugs like ibrutinib, which is a commonly used treatment for CLL to try to help with the T cell fitness. But that's partly why CLL has been, a, it's been in the background a little bit in this whole CD19 CAR T story. Um, and so at the moment, you know, there's nothing in CLL that looks like it's coming towards being a licensed product and available to CLL patients. But actually CLL patients, you know, in the UK are very well served by a multitude of different drugs. I mean, there's so many different um, sort of new and exciting therapies available to, to block CLL. Um, that essentially most CLL patients would prefer to take their tablets, uh, you know, and so many different iterations thereof than go for a CAR T cell therapy. So uh, we have a CAR T cell study for CLL at UCL. Um, and again, it's, you know, we're recruiting actively into that study with our nice, the CAT CAR I mentioned earlier on. Um, but again, you know, patients are often having multiple drug therapies in the meantime, so it's a little less easy to recruit to. In terms of solid cancers, there's a whole great swathe of work that needs to be done. Solid tumours are lagging behind the haematology space, probably by about five years, let's say. It's probably more complex to make a CAR T for solid tumours because they don't necessarily always have nice targets that we can design CAR T cells for. Often the targets on solid tumours, maybe they're expressed at very low level, or maybe they're also expressed on the lung or the heart or the kidney or wherever. So the risk of having a toxicity from that CAR T is perhaps higher in the solid tumor space. But that's not to say that research isn't being done. And again, at UCL, we are doing work looking at things like brain cancers, for instance, both in children and in adults. And we'll have CAR T um, studies up and running at the beginning of next year for those indications. And we're doing lots of you know, lab work at the moment to try and make CAR T cells for liver cancers and prostate cancers and so on. So it's an area of active research and, you know, probably in the future, maybe five years, maybe a little bit longer, we'll sort of see the same traction with solid tumour cars that we've got with blood cars right now. It's really interesting. Um, of course, CAR-T works with your own cells. So if you don't have working cells, essentially, then um, it's not going to work. I think that's a really good way of thinking about the, the CLL space and um, watch the space on that front, I guess. Sarah, anything you wanted to add on on those two questions around other indications at all? Um, yeah, I think that well, there's there's an exciting new innovation even in the context of solid organ malignancies. So um, there's been studies in the US of delivery of CAR T cells for um, CNS malignancies, um, which have shown some dramatic improvements based on how you deliver the CAR T cells. So maybe new ways of delivering the CAR T cells. Um, sometimes directing them closer to the tumour site can, can overcome some of the burden of the, the access issues that CAR T cells face getting into solid organ malignancy settings. Um, I think the, the sort of uh, the difference in the immune context into which those CAR T cells goes because of it being a solid organ malignancy or a different malignancy to B A L L is really important and it's clear that you can make a really effective CAR T cell product that can get into a solid organ malignancy, um, but that it just won't do the job. You can even get good expansion and cytokine release syndrome. And that was a study in glioblastoma um, that we've seen, uh, sorry, neuroblastoma um, at uh, Great Ormond Street. So, you know, it's clear that the metrics that we would use in a haematological malignancy setting don't necessarily apply in a solid organ malignancy setting, even in children, and you can have a really good CAR-T expansion, but it won't do the job of getting rid of the mm -hmm. cancer. Um, so again, I think it's going to be really specific to every single disease setting. I mentioned AML. AML's also got a lot of mechanisms that shut down T cells when you try and um, uh, get T cells activated. So I think we might have a similar situation to CLL trying to target AML. So I think we're going to have to learn the lessons in each individual setting, unfortunately, which means that there'll be disappointments. Um, but hopefully through continued innovation, we can get there. Yeah, the last thing we need is uh, side effects without the efficacy. I think that's probably the worst case scenario for and certainly from a patient perspective. It's really interesting. But it may be necessary if you want to learn what's limiting the child T cells, unfortunately, and that and that 
you know those brave first patients that that go through those mm -hmm. studies to help us learn more um you know without which we couldn't make the improvements that we see absolutely think, um, yeah <laughs> Um, Lee, any thoughts from you on, on the CLL and solid tumour space? You just sort of mentioned this slightly. I asked you the similar question earlier, but anything you wanted to add? Uh, just two small things. So I suppose from a CLL perspective, um, you know, the average age of a CLL patient is 72. Um, so that's a big factor when you talk about treating them with a therapy. I think we, we're treating our patients on, on the trial that Claire mentioned uh, with a car that we've demonstrated to be quite low toxicity. So we're kind of confident that these patients can handle it. Um, and so far that has been our experience. But I think that's always going to be a key factor in any disease you're treating is irrespective of efficacy, um, is it going to be a safe thing to, to give? Um, and then on the you know, solid tumor side, I think it's yeah, definitely going to be interesting how that goes because there's been a lot of attempts already um, in solid tumor. But I think the, the, the key thing is trying to find that target that, that finds um, the, the, the disease without attacking the rest of the body. And we've been quite lucky with leukemias and lymphomas where we have a very reliable target that is on the majority of those diseases uh, and is, is highly effective. So it's just trying to find that, um, I guess, because they kind of get you know, that, 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 that target that works. But it's, it's clearly uh, a bigger challenge than all the other differences. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, Sophie, give you the last word in sort of the last three minutes. Um, it sounds as if there's a couple of people listening who are maybe thinking about CAR-T or sort of having that conversation with their um, with their clinicians. So I wondered whether you had any advice, if you like, if you're trying to decide, uh, is, is CAR-T the right treatment for me alongside my doctor? What would you say to maybe to yourself if you were back in that situation again? Um, that is a hard question. I think I'd just, I don't really know. It's, it's, it is a difficult, you know, position to be in um, when, when you are told that you need car -T, you know, you're in a position where there aren't many options left. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to have something in place. It's nice to think like, you know, you have, you have to give it a go and you have to keep positive throughout it. I know there are going to be bad days and, you know, a lot of people hate, um, when people tell them to stay positive but it really does help um for your own sanity to get through it and you know for you to have a positive support ne network of people around you and also it's so important to connect with other patients you know I was I was in a position where I didn't have anyone to speak to about the treatment who wasn't a child like you know I could only find probably like a couple of like pages on Facebook of families of children who were about five or six having the treatment and you know I couldn't really go to the families for the answers that I needed and with me like I'm quite open on social media and um, Charlotte knows um I basically tweeted the whole way through everything that I went through um and because of doing that I've had quite a few people re reach out to me and ask me questions like about CAR-T and a lot of the questions that I get asked are actually the questions that I had um, so it's just really important to reach out to people who have been in a similar situation to you and, you know, to connect with these people and you might be surprised, you might make some lifelong friends like I have and, you know, people who you can sort of even two years on say, do you have this side effect or do you still feel a bit like this? And they're like, oh yeah, like it's normal. And you're like, oh, okay. Like having that reassurance is really important and just having a good support network. But I would say if you're thinking about it, just go for it. Thank you for that. And um, hopefully it's getting easier and easier for people to connect up as more people have the treatment. Um, but thank you for offering to, to yourself up in that way as well. It must be quite difficult for, for you at times to talk about it like that. Um, thank you to our speakers today and um, for a really interesting conversation. Thank you to everyone listening, actually, for asking so many questions. You've not had <laughs> had me think of any questions of my own throughout the whole webinar, which is just how just how I like it. I'm, I'm pleased that um, we got to talk about um, what you guys um, wanted to, to talk about today. I'm just going to run through some slides very, very quickly before we say goodbye, just to remind you of what else we do here at Leukemia Care. So as well as our webinars, we've got um, lots of other information sources you can use, whether you like reading stuff, such as our magazine, whether you like listening, such as our podcasts, um, and also obviously social media and our website too. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, 
sorry about the wonky picture there, um, but we also provide a, a load of information booklets, including a booklet on um, CAR-T therapy, which talks about the process and any questions you might have if you are about to go through CAR-T. So please um, do um, order that or download it if that is um, useful for you. Next slide, please. Um, we've got a variety of support services as well. If you're looking um, to talk to somebody, um, if you're looking to talk to people like Sophie, maybe our online forums, our Facebook groups and our buddy scheme might be useful for you. Um, obviously, we also do more professional support, such as our counselling fund as well. So do reach out if you're in need of support at all. Um, also, just to mention, if you're looking for clinical trials in particular, our advocacy caseworker is a good person to talk to. Um, she can help you find um, clinical trials that may or may not be relevant for you um, or if you're looking to travel we can we can help you find some support with that so um, do um, get in touch if you if you'd like more information on where you can get car tea. and oh that's a good link um, we are also doing a, a webinar in December, which is the next one, talking about what advocacy is and what we can do. So if you're not sure what we do at the advocacy service, do pop along to that webinar as well. And me and my colleague Ella will be talking uh, about the work we do there. Um, here's just a quick reminder of where you can find us online, various platforms, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Next slide, please. And I'll leave this up while I say thank you again to Claire, Sarah, Lee and Sophie for a really interesting conversation. Some lovely feedback already um, in the chat. So I hope you've seen that and um, we really do appreciate your time. So thank you again and have a lovely evening. Thanks for inviting us, Charlotte. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.